have been um, scheduling these speakers for the Thursday professional lecture series. However, it's Monday night this time because we're juxtaposed in a sh shift for uh, on the calendar for the spring conference this week. Um, let me introduce Dr. Carrie Collier, who is the director of the Bowen Center so that she can make some comments before we begin. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight. This is, I think, um, going to be an interesting presentation uh, with Ms. Copeland coming up on our spring conference, which is Friday and Saturday. And we have invited the executive vice president of the American Ancestors, Ryan Woods. Mr. Woods will be talking about his genealogical research at American Ancestors. And Bowen faculty and um, invited guests will be presenting on their family research um, and more about the emotional process versus just the genealogical history. So I think it will be an interesting weekend and I think this gets us started in thinking. So. Thank you, Ms. Copeland, and thank you, Ms. Curran, for introducing her and setting this off. Welcome, everybody, and especially Libby Copeland. Um, and let me get my information. Many of you have likely spit in a vial and submitted it to 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, or some other DNA testing site. Initially, people were intrigued to explore from whence they came culturally, exhibiting a more recreational use. Genealogists found DNA research helpful in discovering one's family history and connections. <clears throat> DNA testing has opened many benefits for individuals and families as well as opening Pandora's box. Ms. Libby Copeman has staff, was a staff reporter and editor at the Washington Post for 11 years and was offered an opportunity in 2017 to write a front page article um, about the family surprises generated by home DNA testing. The article gen generated enormous response from readers who told their stories about their own experiences with testing. This became the basis for her book published in 2020, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Up Ending Who We Are. Ms. Copeland's research fits nicely into the theme, Unlocking the Mystery of the Family Emotional History for the Bowen Center Spring Conference on Zoom, April 9 and 10 later this week. The book is fascinating is a fascinating read in researching the evolution of DNA testing and the ability to offer this resource to the public. DNA testing has been done for many years in medicine to track inherited conditions, but it is now used in a much broader context. It is used by anyone to resource and delve into family history and relationships among other things, with the majority resulting in positive outcomes, but some clearly uncovering disturbing unknown family secrets. Ms. Copeland is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in English. <clears throat> she was a 2010 media fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Her article for Esquire.com, Kate Still Here, won Hearst Magazine's 2017 Editorial Excellence Award for reported feature or profile. She previously won first prize in the feature specialty category from the Society for Features Journalism, then called AASFE. Currently, Ms. Copeland is a freelance journalist with a focus on culture, science, and human behavior. She writes for such media outlets as The Atlantic, New York, Smithsonian, the New York Times, the New Republic, the Wall Street Journal, among other notables. She lives in Westchester, New York with her husband and two children. Let's welcome Ms. Copeland as she talks to us about her research and book on the lost family. Hi everyone, 
Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me. And um, can everyone hear me? Give me just a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to screen share. I have a PowerPoint to you, and I'm really excited um, to show you this uh, to show you this and give you this talk. So. Um, I'm just going to share that. So, um, you know, it's it's really exciting to me to be able to talk about this. Um, I wrote a new talk for tonight because I'm so interested in the in the work that the Bowen Center does. And so um, to be part of this professional lecture series is a really um, it's really a thrill. Um, and I'm really excited to be talking about a topic that I have been researching for years that I find endlessly fascinating and important, and that is uh, the recreational DNA testing industry, um, which is the topic of my book, The Lost Family, how DNA testing is upending who we are, and um, and more generally, my research. I continue to write about this in op-eds. I continue to get emails from people who've, whose lives have been changed by this technology. Um, my research looks at how this industry is impacting our lives in intimate and often unforeseen ways, inviting us to rethink what we thought we knew about ourselves and our families, not to mention ethnicity and race and the influences of nature and nurture in our own lives. The at-home DNA testing industry is often referred to as recreational um, to distinguish it from the kind of genetic testing that you would get in your doctor's office. Um, and also because the marketing of it is framed as entertainment, right? Um, we think of the, if you think of the ads, um, it's the, the product is framed in terms of find out who your ancestors are, learn more about your family, find out if you're really a quarter Italian. Um, but as we'll see, the impact of this industry on individual lives is often much more profound than the term recreational implies. Uh, it can have deep and lasting impacts on our most intimate relationships, and it raises um, age old essential human questions that go to the heart of how we construct our own identities. Uh, just a note before I begin, um, the Bowen Center, of course, has permission to record this, but if you're just a member of the audience, please don't record or screenshot the talk. Um, and I'm going to move on to my next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the industry that I'll be talking about today is just over two decades old, and it has changed radically over the course of those years with implications for all of us, even those of us who've never tested. Uh, DNA testing for ancestry purposes started in the United States with a company down in Houston, Texas called Family Tree DNA, which sent out its first test, kit, test kits in the spring of 2000. Um, back then, the kind of DNA tests that were available were much cruder, less informative, and more expensive than what's available now. They could tell you about your ancient origins along certain lines, but they could not give you the breadth of information about your more recent genetic ancestry and your immediate genetic kin. That information is now available through DNA testing, but it wasn't 21 years ago. Uh, so this first company, Family Tree DNA down in Texas, it was founded by a genealogist and serial entrepreneur named Bennett Greenspan, who had a very personal reason to want this product to exist. Um, he had by the late 90s hit what genealogists like to call a brick wall in his own family history research. He had a question that the paper records could not answer and he realized that DNA might be able to. But at the time, DNA testing wasn't a consumer product. It was a means for um, scientists to research human genetics in the lab. And Greenspan had the idea of teaming up with a scientist to make these kits available to anyone who was willing to pay. Um, I was able to fly down to Texas and interview him for the book and he told me that you know, at first, when he first came up with this product, um, he envisioned it as a very narrow product catering to a niche audience. Um, and in fact, for a long time, that's exactly just what it was. Um, at genealogical conferences, he would of course go and he would work very hard to try to persuade people that his product would be of interest to these fellow genealogists at these conferences. Um, sometimes he told me he literally strong armed people by shaking their hands and then talking and walking backwards toward his booth without letting go, hoping that if he could just get folks into proximity um, to his DNA test kits, then they might buy them. Um, and about a decade ago, there is a sea change in this industry. 
when something called autosomal DNA testing comes on the scene. And autosomal DNA testing is the kind of DNA testing that you are probably familiar with. Um, it's what's most popular now. It's what companies like 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, and MyHeritage now offer um, primarily. And when you spit into a vial or you swab your cheek with one of these autosomal DNA test kits, you're getting two key pieces of information. You're getting your so-called ethnicity estimate, um, which is a pie chart estimating where in the world the various branches of your family tree, tree came from um, approximately 500 to 1,000 years ago. And you're getting your DNA matches, which is people um, who have tested with the same company and they are identified as genetic relatives because you and they share overlapping genetic segments and the company can tell that. And so it can kind of identify those people and say, this is a DNA cousin um, and, and give you, you know, list them out by their names or their initials, however they've chosen to be identified. Um, and these genetic relatives are along your maternal and paternal lines, and they're, um, they're, you know, they're relatively closer to you than the kind of relatives that you were getting back in the old days with the cruder kind of test that Bennett Greenspan originally came up with. So this is a growth chart, um, which looks at recreational DNA testing customers in the millions, and you can see it's a really steep slope. Um, if you look back at 2013, which is where this chart starts and which is like really in many ways the dawn of autosomal DNA testing, um, you see about a million test kits sold across five major databases at the time. And so at this point in 2013, it is still somewhat of this niche product that Bennett Greenspan imagined it would be. Um, but you can see that slope going up. And then in 2016 and 2017, Ancestry, which would become the big behemoth in the space in terms of database size, puts $100 million into advertising in each year. And during this period, uh, DNA testing moves beyond the space of the serious genealogist and comes to also occupy the realm of the casual consumer. And these are consumers who uh, like are merely curious. They they may not know much about their family histories. They haven't been working on it for decades. Um, they may have bought a test kit on a whim because they saw it on sale, or they got it as a gift for the holidays, um, which is how I got my first DNA test kit. Um, so this product becomes, you know, the gift you get for the person in your life who already has everything. Um, and the ads for DNA testing, um, they talk about people discovering their true family stories. They talk about um, bringing people, bringing family together. Um, and they imply that whatever discoveries are made will come with a certain degree of, um, say, emotional and historical remove. And of course, for most people, that is indeed the case. Um, for most people, this technology is perhaps deepening their understanding of themselves or their own family histories but they're not learning anything that fundamentally disrupts it. Um, still, for a sizable minority of consumers, what they discover prompts them to reconsider what they thought they understood about the past, about their parents' private lives, and about the nature of truth itself. And because Americans are engaging with this technology in the context of entertainment, they're often quite unprepared for surprises when they come. So if you follow this chart past 2018, if it kept going, um, you would see a slowdown in these sales of spit kits, but the numbers are still going up. They're just going up more slowly. Uh, so in the summer of 2017, when I started writing my book, um, there were 8 million DNA test kits sold. And today, not quite four years later, there are 37 million sold, the majority of them to Americans. More than 15% of the US adult population has taken a mail-in DNA test kit. Um, and Americans have adopted ancestry testing with such enthusiasm um, that because of the shared nature of our genetic material, the majority of the country's population is in some sense opted into the technology. That's because even if you've never tested, you may wind up learning important facts about your family or your health simply because a relative has, has tested. Um, the pace of change and the size of these databases has been incredibly important for communities of people who set out looking for a genetic kin. So let's take, for an example, someone who was adopted and um, because of the laws in her state, she cannot access her original birth certificate that would give her the names of her birth parents. And this information is, is just can be so incredibly important, not only for understanding 
um, one's medical history, but for understanding one's roots and oneself, and potentially for reaching out and forging relationships, if possible, to living parents or living siblings. So once upon a time, say 20 years ago, um, someone who was searching for the identity of her birth mother might have paid a private detective for years in hopes of figuring this out and still never managed to succeed. Um, eight years ago, when the recreational DNA databases were relatively small, that same person might have tested and tried to unravel her birth mom's identity from multiple third and fourth cousins she matched in the database, a job that could involve genealogical research going back many generations and could take months or years if it were even possible. So back then, again, just eight years ago, which is um, not very long ago, but a very long time in terms of this technology, um, if an adopted person managed to find a second cousin match in a database, they were considered very lucky um, because that was unusual and because that made it much easier for them because the closer the cousin, the, the easier it is to use um, what are known as genetic genealogy techniques to identify a parent. Nowadays, the databases are so large that people are testing and very quickly finding a first cousin, an aunt, a half sibling, even the parent herself. So all of this means that those looking for a genetic kin can find them much more quickly. And this also means that those who don't know that their families or their own genetic ancestries aren't what they seem will very quickly find that out. Um, in other words, even if consumers never intended to be asking a very big and profound question, am I who I believe myself to be, they are in the act of spitting into a tube asking that very question. And in the absence of knowing the outcome of a test, it is impossible to know uh, how you'll react or feel in response to this news. So I want to talk about the most common kinds of DNA surprises. Um, the first category is what are known as NPEs or MPEs. NPE is a, is a kind of an older term from genealogy, and it refers to a non-paternity event. Um, sometimes it's now um, defined as not parent expected. MPE stands for misattributed parentage experience. These are all terms that refer to the experience of spitting into a tube and discovering that one or both parents is not genetically related to you, typically a dad. Um, and that's probably the most common kind. Um, up, it's also up there, a very, very common scenario within this universe of DNA surprises is the discovery of previously unknown siblings or half siblings. So um, perhaps one of your parents had a child uh, a long time ago before your parents even got together. Um, and that child is now being discovered, this, this, this older half sister is being discovered um, through her presence in a database or through um, the presence of other relatives in a database. Um, there's the category of certainly adopted people who have who pioneered techniques to use um, to use DNA testing to find their families. And within that universe of adopted people, there are sometimes people who don't know that they are adopted um, and they are discovering that they are adopted because they took a DNA test. And I write about um, one such experience, um, a woman named Linda in, in my book, and I'll come back to her. Um, there are donor conceived people uh, who are, um, you know, might not have been told that they were conceived, um, that they were, that, you know, that a, that a sperm donor was involved in their conception. Um, they were perhaps conceived 60, 70 years ago when um, the use of a, of a sperm donor might have been heavily stigmatized. Their parents might not even be alive anymore so that they can ask questions about the circumstances of how they came to be. Um, and, and interestingly for this particular community of people, um, within the US, there are no legal restrictions on the number of children that one donor can help conceive. So you see these sprawling genetic networks of um, sometimes upwards of 20 half siblings, sometimes more than 50. And there are indeed even some um, families with between 100 and 200 half siblings that have been documented. Um, there may be some that are larger in which all the half siblings have not yet been found. Um, Bennett Greenspan, to go back to him, uh, the founder of the oldest company, Family Tree DNA, um, he has a kind of a dry sense of humor, and he has rightly pointed out that the industry he helped create um, has rendered the notion of an anonymous sperm donor an, into an oxymoron, akin to the phrase jumbo shrimp, and he likes to go around um, using that um, line when he gives talks. <laughs> 
Um, there's also another category of people, which is those who um, have hidden genetic ancestry. So people who just come from families that, that for reasons of escape from discrimination or in order to assimilate, hid their true community of origin. So for instance, um, historically and in more recent times, there are groups of um, Jews who for various, various reasons either were forced to convert or more recently simply assimilated their way out of their Jewish identities. Um, there are light-skinned African-Americans who to escape rampant um, discrimination chose to pass as white. And I tell a story in my book about one such man who um, discovers through DNA testing that is that that was a choice that his mother made on his behalf and he um, finds through DNA testing that in fact he is not Sicilian but in fact um, has significant sub-Saharan African ancestry and his mother was trying to protect him from discrimination by not telling him that. Um, and then the last category of, of discoveries, I just call that and more because there's just um, many other kinds of um, variations on, um, on discoveries that can be made um, in your family. It may go back a few generations. It may be as distant as the discovery of a first or second cousin, but it still may have meaningful impacts uh, on your conception of your family, your understanding of your family's history and, and indeed of, your, of yourself and your parents. So how common are these um, genetic surprises? Um, my conservative estimate through research and interviews um, with genetic genealogists and population geneticists is that at least 3% uh, um, of testers have discovered a non-paternity event or a previously unknown half-sibling, um, though some experts and surveys put the number far higher, but I like to go with a more conservative and lesser percentage. Um, if it is just 3%, um, that means that at least a million people who have themselves spit into a tube or swabbed their cheek have discovered a major DNA surprise about themselves or their own immediate families. But that, of course, doesn't capture it because there are these other categories um, of surprise. And, um, and simply because the way genetic secrets sort of refract across families, each revelation can easily impact eight to 10 people. So in fact, we are, we're looking at millions of people discovering or um, affected by these discoveries. So if, you, if you're thinking about it in terms of like misattributed parentage experiences um, uh, or non-paternity events, um, it helps to think of this in terms of a triad. There's the person um, discovering the surprise about her own genetic origins. There's the parents who raised her, including her dad, who she now knows is not genetically related, to her and to whom she may now go with questions, um, to both of her parents, in fact. Um, and there's her genetic father and his family who she may now reach, wish to reach out to and who may or may not know of her existence. Um, so all of, those, all of those kind of categories of people are impacted by, um, by the single consumer taking the test and making this discovery. Um, there are a few reasons why I think it's important to think and to talk about this technology, whether or not you've taken a DNA test. The first is simply a practical concern because of the shared nature of our genetic material. Uh, those who haven't tested are increasingly opted in regardless of, of their choice to, to test or not test because of the decisions of others to test. Um, so how does this play out? Let's take a theoretical scenario in which um, I have a brother and my brother unknowingly conceived a child when he was in high school 30 years ago. Um, now that child that he conceived is grown up and let's say that she wants to know the identity of her genetic father. She doesn't know it. Um, she can take a DNA test and let's say my brother, her father is not in the database, but hey, I am and I show up um, as her genetic aunt. So she can reach out to me to learn the name of my brother or she can just Google my name. Um, I have left such a rich trail of genetic breadcrumbs about, uh, I'm sorry, a rich trail of breadcrumbs about me online, right? Digital breadcrumbs as we all have, um, that it's fairly easy for her to discover that perhaps I have three brothers. And um, from there on, she can write then a letter to all three brothers and saying, hey, I think one of you is my genetic father. And how that plays out for those men, um, my brothers is another part of the story and it may be, um, incredibly complicated. And I write about just this exact circumstance in, um, in the lost family of the three brothers and the letter. Um, my brother may be happy to know his child and his wife may not be happy to know that he has this child. Um, or one of his children is thrilled 
to have a new older half sister and the other feels threatened or disturbed by it. Um, the 360 of how these situations play out and the different competing interests and perceptions are really key to our understanding of where we are and really important um, in order for us to bring compassion to these complex situations. And one of the main themes that I have explored in my research, um, but for argument's sake, um, you know, it doesn't even have to be as easy. Um, I don't have to be the sister of the man in question that is being sought out. Um, I could be his first cousin, his second cousin, even third cousin matches can be enough to discover the identity of somebody who is not in the database. So I think that's important to know because it means that the decision of somebody who is related to you um, but who you may never have met, right? Because you may not know all your third cousins. You may not know any of your third cousins. Um, that person by testing is in some sense making a decision for you. And um, you very likely already have third cousins and closer cousins in the databases given their size. Uh, a few years ago, Ancestry, which again has the biggest database, was telling its customers that on average, each of its customers was finding when they tested 50,000 genetic relatives in this databases, 50,000. Think about that. In other words, even if you haven't tested, you are not invisible. Um, some of your genetic information is already in these databases. But the other reason I think this technology is important, even to those who don't test or should be, um, is because I think that the questions it raises and makes personal are these, as I said earlier, these sort of essential human questions. Um, who am I and why? What part of me is nature and what part nurture? What is the essential me? And, and who would I have been if I had been raised in another town, in another country, in another family? Um, for that matter, how do I define family? How do I define a father? And how can DNA testing prompt me to think deeply for the first time about how I wanna answer that question? Um, how do I define my ethnicity, these forces that shape my orientation on the world? And if I'm discovering at the age of 50 that my genetic ancestry isn't what I've always believed, how much of my self-conception should that new in, newfound information get to shape? Um, how do revelations about family and ethnicity and identity contained in these DNA tests, um, how do they measure up against a lifetime of experience? And how do the vagaries of history and love and and stigma and discrimination and intention get to play into my decision about all of that. So I want to back up and explain some of what Anne was starting to tell you about how I came to be interested in this topic. Um, I've always been interested in stories about ordinary people and extraordinary circumstances, um, stories about uh, how we're formed and how we define ourselves, our motivations, our morals, our personal narratives. Um, and several years ago, I was in conversation with my editor at the Washington Post, and we were talking about DNA testing and how sometimes people go into testing with specific expectations or no expectations, right? And they get these results that are completely unexpected. Um, and, and, it's, and the question we were asking was, and then what, right? Like, what do they do with that information? How do they process it? How do they adjust? How does, it, how does it affect their, um, their personal relationships, their beliefs about the past, um, their outlook on the world? So um, I wound up writing about this for the Washington Post and this story went viral, as they say. And, and I got this, just this flood of reader email um, from, from hundreds of, of people saying, you know, um, I like that story, but now I wanna tell you mine. Um, you know, I tested in 2012, I tested in 2015, I, I tested three months ago. Um, and here's what I found and here's how it changed my life. Um, and I, I found these stories really moving. They were emotionally powerful. They were intimate. They were touching, um, they were touching people where we are at our most vulnerable. Um, and they were provocative because, um, because people were grappling with some really interesting um, existential and you know, even bioethical conundrums. And there was very little sort of bioethical um, guidance for them. Um, so, for instance, if through testing you discover your elderly mom was not related to her own father and she doesn't know it, do you tell her? Um, are you permitted to tell her, given how upsetting the news might be? Um, and on the other hand, do you have the right to withhold that information? Or um, let's say you are in your 60s and you were adopted and raised as an only child, and DNA testing suddenly makes it possible uh, to learn that you have a, a brother who's alive. 
how do you go about deciding whether to contact him if he might not know you exist? And how do you forge a relationship with a brother so late in life? And what are the contours of that bittersweet experience, um, the gift of a brother and the loss of never having been able to, to forge shared memories up to that point? Um, the reader emails are what convinced me I needed to write a book because they demonstrated what a widespread and seismic cultural phenomenon these DNA discoveries amounted to, a kind of um, genetic reckoning with the past and with the things we were never told. And um, they weren't limited to just one demographic or just a few communities. They were reshaping the lives of Americans from all walks of life. That is what I, I became convinced of. Um, and I wanted to tell these stories and I wanted to, when possible, give a sense of how these stories play out and what factors influence how they play out. So um, I decided to shape um, to shape the lost family's central narrative around the tale of a woman named Alice. Um, this is Alice, and she tested in 2012 at the dawn of autosomal DNA testing. Uh, she had been a genealogist for years. She was raised in a large Irish Catholic family. So she went into it knowing what she was going to find. She was um, sort of assuming that the the pie, the ethnicity estimate pie chart that she was going to get was going to tell her that her ancestry was entirely from the British Isles and mostly from Ireland. Um, but she figured that information would be helpful because it would help her unravel more about her family's past in Ireland. So, you know, maybe she would find some Irish cousins, maybe she could um, isolate um, precisely what areas in Ireland they came from. Um, but when she took the test, she found something that she did not expect and which she thought at first must be a mistake. The ancestry DNA test informed her that she was only half that British Isles Irish um, mix that she expected. The other half of her pie chart was completely unexpected. It was she it was that she uh, was half Ashkenazi Jewish <laughs> um, and that's Jews from Eastern and Central Europe who have a unique genetic signature that looks different from someone who comes from Ireland. <laughs> and if you're not muted, if you could mute, that would be, that would be great, thank you. Um, so this is a photograph that goes back to the beginnings of Alice's genetic mystery. Um, it was taken in 1914. And that little baby on his father's lap would turn out to be key to Alice's understanding of who she is. Um, because she eventually needed to trace, believe it or not, she needed to trace her family um, story back a century to understand how she had gotten her understanding of her own family so wrong and to uncover what were truly shocking circumstances that formed the setup for her discovery all those years later. Um, I found Alice's story really compelling. Um, first, because, you know, she really kind of launched herself whole heartedly on what I can only describe as a kind of existential mystery. Um, she became the detective in her own whodunit, um, and she doggedly kept at her own genealogical um, work day after day, and she made it into her full-time job, and she pursued it for two and a half years. Um, and her story is fascinating because her journey takes many twists and turns, and its ultimate resolution is not at all what anyone could have predicted. Um, so she's this extremely methodical um, mind, and she decides to explore all the possible reasons why her DNA results weren't what she expected, starting with the most likely. And this is another reason why I love her story, because it kind of contains within it many other stories. Um, she went through all the possible explanations for unexpected genetic ancestry, so a sort of half unexpected um, genetic ancestry. And she went through the possibility that she was um, the product of a non-paternity event, but she was able to eliminate that methodically using her scientific approach. Um, <clears throat> she went through the possibility that she was adopted. She was able to eliminate that. Um, she wound up testing all of her siblings and testing most of her family and testing, I think, over 20 people ultimately by the time things were done. Um, she was able to eliminate the possibility that she was donor conceived. She was able to ultimately eliminate the possibility that she came from a community that had um, hidden its genetic ancestry to escape from discrimination. Um, and all, all of these kind of theories, I mean, I, I showed you earlier the kind of um, most common scenarios that explain a DNA surprise. Um, all these theories she sensed early on were the most likely and none of them turned out to be the explanation in her case. Um, but the beauty of using her story as the narrative spine of the 
book was that I could uh, explore so many other stories, right? So um, each time she goes into a theory, she explores the possibility of um, being the product of a non-paternity event. I get to kind of look at some of the reporting into um, people who are experiencing non-paternity events. Um, and it, another reason that Alice is kind of a great um, vehicle, um, a kind of a fascinating human being um, is because it turned out she was uniquely suited to solving this mystery because of her skills and her personality. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that back in the early days, the databases were extremely small and that made genetic mysteries very hard to solve. And, and that was true for Alice. The databases were very small. It was extremely challenging and then some, um, and yet Alice, is you know she was tenacious she's funny she's deeply methodical so she she happened to have this advantage which was that she had spent her whole life working in technology managing the organization and flow of countless tiny bits of information um she told me once i'm not intimidated by lots of data and this would turn out to be precisely the skill set that she needed because she wound up having to create many many spreadsheets containing information about the hundreds of thousands of tiny overlapping genetic segments that she and her siblings shared with thousands of cousins in order to unravel the truth about her past and understand how she'd gotten her history wrong. So what happens for people like Alice? What happens when people learn about the truths that shaped them even before they knew about them? Um, the discovery is often just the very start. It's what comes next, that's the real journey. First, as people incorporate this new information into their identities, why is this uh, information like the discovery, for instance, that you're not genetically related to dad? Why is that so important? Um, of course, these revelations can have bearing on people's medical histories and their health outcomes. But um, in today's talk, I really want to focus on the emotional and yes, again, that word, the existential import of these discoveries, right? The way that they influence how we think about our own identities and our relationships with loved ones. So over the past four years, I've, I've interviewed or corresponded with hundreds of people, and um, they've told me about how DNA testing and genealogy have affected their lives. And so I want to share some of the nuggets of wisdom from interviews that I've done with these um, people that I call seekers. That's a term that I use to describe people who've sought understanding of themselves through better understanding of their own origins um, and families. So for instance, many people say that these revelations can explain mysteries that they long wondered about and cause them to reassess the past. If they're like a woman named Ricky that I interviewed who discovered in her 60s that she was donor conceived with a number of previously unknown donor siblings, um, they may describe waking up in the middle of the night with old memories that they haven't thought of in years, memories that suddenly have new context. Um, something their mother said or a father's lifelong depression, all of that takes on fresh meaning in light of this new knowledge. I think, you know, we're, we're basically storytellers. That's, that's what human beings do. Um, you know, we fit the facts of our lives into narratives that make sense and that explain ourselves. And what people like Ricky told me is that when you're beginning your, your once upon a time changes, it alters everything else, right? It doesn't just contain to that once upon a time, it changes the trajectory of the rest of your story. Um, in other words, through DNA testing, the past actively changes the present. Um, people may experience a sense of dis disorientation or dislocation upon learning their families and the roots aren't what they believed. Many describe a sense of shock, anger, and overwhelmingly, they describe it as a traumatic experience. Um, they may go to their parents with questions, prompting incredibly difficult conversations and sometimes prompting rifts. Uh, they may seek out professional therapists to help them through the experience. And in fact, in the last few years, I've seen the emergence of a new category of mental health professionals who have <clears throat> emerged to work with people experiencing a phenomenon that, again, barely existed 10 years ago, right? Which is the, the revelation of misattributed parentage arising from DNA testing. It's astonishing to think of how much has happened in the last decade. <clears throat> and at the same time, um, over and over, these seekers who discovered surprising things through their tests, they told me that um, that they were glad to know the truth. Um, overwhelmingly, they said that, um, even when that truth was painful, because the truth is so integral to their understanding of ourselves, of, of themselves. So, so trauma and gratitude 
um, all bound up together, right, in the same experience. It's, it's a bittersweet experience often because it often involves the revelation of newfound family and the consciousness of the loss of decades during which relationships could have been forged. Um, and it can also be bittersweet because it allows for self-knowledge at the same time as it causes friction with parents who didn't tell an adult child about his or her genetic origins. Um, and it may involve rejection from a newly discovered genetic parent and that parent's family. So I was struck by the linguistic commonalities among people I interviewed who were discovering genetic surprises. And I wanted to briefly address them here because I think they speak to the universality of these experiences and can help those of us who haven't had these experiences gain a better sense of what they might feel like. So upon learning their origins and families weren't what they thought, some people invoked a sense of disorientation and, and aloneness that I've taken to calling the lonely boat metaphor. Um, it's a sense of being cast out into the water. So a woman named Jackie described it to me this way. She said, I felt like somebody just stuck me on a raft and pushed me out to sea. Um, and a woman named Krista, who I interviewed, described it like this. She said, it's like being unmoored. It's being untethered. Um, or in the words of my book's protagonist, Alice, explaining her discovery of her unexpected ancestry and with all that it might imply about her family and her own identity, she said, um, I felt adrift. I didn't know who I was, you know, who I really was. So what does it mean that so many people independent of one another use such strikingly similar language to describe their experiences? I think that it speaks to the idea that this this sense of disorientation, what one psychologist I spoke with called, um, quote, anxiety at the loss of identity, that that, um, that experience is a common and understandable response to having one's own story, one's own narrative of oneself disrupted in a fundamental way, and the pressing need to understand and establish, you know, basically a new narrative of the self. Um, but that wasn't the only example of people using remarkably similar language to describe their experiences. Um, many people who'd gotten surprise DNA results about themselves spoke of a deep sense of yearning, sometimes described as a hole that needed to be filled by knowing more about themselves and where they'd come from. And last, many spoke of the importance of knowing their roots, of orienting themselves on this earth, um, of the power of history and truth and context for their present day selves and their perspectives on the world. So an adopted woman named Gay told me that the experience of DNA testing in genealogy was that it was, quote, grounding and validating. She said, you've put your stake in the ground and it's in Belarus or it's in French Canada or it's in New Orleans. It's, wow, my people came from here. And another woman told me of the first time she met her half sibling, she said, quote, it's like magnets. I may not know where the other end of the magnet is, but I'm being pulled to it. How can we answer anything about ourselves if we don't know what our roots are, she said, if we don't know who our people are. But you often can't assimilate this new information into your identity until you know the context for it. And this is the other part of the journey, getting to know the people who pass down your genes and who you share genetic material with. And people who've learned something surprising about their own origins often want to reach out to their biological family members, or at the very least, research those families and their deeper roots. And this is where things get complicated. Um, if you do a kind of 360 of what these situations look like from different perspectives, um, it can look radically different just depending on where you stand into re in relationship to this, the family secret that's being discovered. So one of the themes that I encountered over and over in stories of people seeking their biological families was the tension between the results of a DNA surprise and a family's understanding of itself. So we all have stories that we tell about our families, our sacred narratives, if you will. For instance, a sacred narrative about a long, happy and faithful marriage between, um, you know, a matriarch and patriarch of a family. Um, and then we have what our genetic information reveals, which sometimes conflicts with those narratives. And when that happens, the news that comes via DNA testing can be seen as threatening to a family's cohesiveness, to the position of its elders, um, to relationships built on decades of trust. So um, Jackie, for instance, a woman I interviewed who um, was a foundling at birth, she was left on a, on a pastor's doorstep as an infant, she was subsequently adopted into a family. Um, she said that when she 
finally located her maternal siblings, they told her that they didn't trust the DNA results demonstrating that they were her genetic half sisters because of what that revelation would suggest about their late mother. They said, uh, our mother wouldn't do that. That's what they told her. Um, and she was heartbroken at their response. And another seeker um, spoke about her genetic father's rejection of their relationship. By the time she found him, he was elderly and he appeared to, she said, feel guilty that he'd lived most of his life without knowing that he had a daughter um, uh, and without being able to take responsibility for her. Um, and um, this woman, this seeker said to me of her father's rejection, she said, we all tell ourselves stories about who we are and we pick and choose what fits into that story. I feel like I don't fit the narrative he's chosen. So the nature of the news that comes from testing can have a big impact on how a person is received by newly found family. And of course, that's not something that is in the control of this seeker, this person who's reaching out, um, but it can be helpful in giving context to those responses that are less than open armed. And perhaps it may help make those responses feel a little less personal if that's possible. Um, one way to frame the massive shift that's taking place right now in this era of genetic reckoning is to think about it as a clash of cultures. Uh, for many families, DNA testing represents a collision between present day culture and the culture of the past, which are drastically different. I love this quote from novelist um, L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Um, this, these days we live in what you might call um, a culture of transparency and authenticity in many ways. Um, you know, we, we talk about finding ourselves through the search for roots. Um, we're much more open with our children and our communities about the many different ways that a family can be made. Um, but 60, 70 years ago, many things that are much more accepted now were stigmatized or simply considered private. Um, and even the child, him or herself, might not have been told that, um, that she or he was um, adopted or donor conceived or brought into the world by a single mom. Um, and in some instances, the circumstances surrounding how a child was conceived were deeply painful um, and not something that mothers wish to share with their children. And so secrets, they tend to have this um, incredible inertia, it seems, um, uh, that at least I, I, I found that in, anecdotally um, in family after family that secrets have this inertia um, where they, they sort of stay suspended in amber uh, year after year, even as the culture around them changes. There's, there's never the right moment somehow um, for the parent sometimes to tell their child something um, unexpected about their, about their origins. So part of what makes um, the collision of these two cultures so difficult is that the, the emotions underlying the decision to make and keep those secrets are still there and still fresh all these years later. Emotions like guilt, fear, anger, and shame. And that can make these situations and the ensuing discussions quite painful and volatile. So, and then there's another kind of collision at work, which is the collision between one person's right to privacy and another's right to know his or her own genetic origins. Um, and this is evidenced in situations like that of a man named Jason I interviewed, um, who could never get his mom to tell him the identity of his genetic dad. He was in his thirties by the time he finally persuaded her. Um, and he persuaded her by telling her basically, if you don't tell me, um, I'm gonna start asking around because I hear there's some cousins who might know some things. Um, and that sort of forced his mom's hand. And she wrote back with a name, a name of his genetic father and little else. And she said to him in her note, she said, um, here's what you wanted. Sorry, it took so long. I would just as soon leave as is. But Jason, um, he told me he could not leave as is. He wanted to know his father. Um, he was one of those who described a yearning inside um, a desire to fill the hole or the missing piece that he felt had been with him all his life long, which was this um, absence of knowledge of his genetic father. So long story short, Jason writes a letter to this man that he believes is his genetic father, the name that his mom gave him. Um, the man lives a few hours away and they forge this restrained father-son relationship. Um, the man told him that he had dated Jason's mother in college and he's He's kind and he's polite, but he does not welcome Jason into his life and he does not tell his adult children that Jason exists. And instead, their relationship consists of once or twice a year, they go golfing together and they do this for over a decade. So Jason told me later that 
this arm's length relationship was what drove him to take a DNA test because he thought that once he could prove uh, that he was related to the man he believed to be his father, that that would improve their relationship. Um, he basically, he said, I wanted to stop feeling like a secret. Um, so he takes this DNA test in 2016 at the urging of a friend who's a genealogist. Um, and it is through the DNA test that he discovers that he, he has the wrong man. Um, the name that his mother gave him is not in fact his genetic father. And his, his actual genetic father, um, neither his genetic father nor his, um, the man he thought was his father, neither of them was in the database. Um, but that, that, that wasn't really a barrier at all because his genealogist friend looked at his genetic relatives and could very quickly, swiftly, um, basically place him into a totally different family from the one that he thought he was related to as the likely son of one of three brothers. Um, and I tell that story in the book of the letter that he writes to all three of them. So um, in my reporting, I encountered a number of stories like Jason's stories in which mothers could not or would not talk to their children about how they come into the world um, or the identity of their fathers. Um, perhaps they did not know who the father was and how could they tell their children that um, perhaps the circumstances surrounding the conception had been traumatic. Um, had involved coercion or violence. Um, and the questions, they brought back shame or anger or an experience that was simply too private to share. And they brought back a world in which, you know, pregnant teenager was whispered about and shunned. Um, and that is the thing about DNA testing. It sort of brings old taboos to the fore. It brings um, secrets that are like the proverbial snowball that keeps rolling down the hill and keeps getting bigger with each um, passing day and passing year. How do you undo a secret? That is sort of the essential question that um, that the DNA testing age has kind of forced. Um, and you see this collision in some of the quotes that I have here on this slide. Um, one of the more moving stories I tell in the book is that of a man named Robert, a longtime sperm donor. In the, he was a sperm donor in the 1970s, um, and he's discovered that he helped conceive at least 23 donor children. And he didn't set out, by the way, to make this discovery. Um, indeed, many sperm donors were promised anonymity when they sold their sperm. Few of them could have anticipated the DNA testing age. Um, but I liked his wife's quote best. It sums up their discovery some years back that there was such a thing as DNA databases. She said, surprise. <laughs> um, and, you know, that it was at that point they realized that that, that promise of anonymity was, was rendered moot. Um, the navigation of those relationships, both for him and for his donor children, proves a very delicate dance to balance. Um, it's a balance of of openness and boundaries, right? Because these are at once strangers and deeply intimate relations, at least on a genetic level. Um, one man who tested his DNA thinking that all he'd get was that pie chart telling him how, um, say how Irish he was, um, he matched to a daughter he never knew existed. And um, when his biological daughter, Lori, told him they lined up in the database as father and child, he told her, but I didn't test for that, right? Because he thought he was just testing for ancestry. And a few days after their phone call, he cut off contact and he deleted his kit. Um, but he could not delete his daughter's knowledge of what she had found. And Lori, the daughter, a longtime genealogist, she continued her research into her paternal side, connecting with biological cousins and even legally changing her last name to her genetic father's last name. Because she said, regardless of whether her genetic father wanted to acknowledge her, her, his roots were her roots too. And we see this tension between privacy and self-knowledge over and over. Um, one of the most challenging aspects of being a seeker, reaching out to genetic family, uh, is being the messenger of your own existence. So we all know the phrase, don't shoot the messenger, um, which alludes to the idea that the person bringing difficult news is often made to bear the brunt of the recipient's anger or disappointment. And one of the terrible ironies of the way that some family overtures can play out is the fact that people who are reaching out in hopes of reuniting with newly found family who may themselves only have recently learned the truth about their own genetic origins are sometimes shut out despite the fact that they had nothing to do with how they came to be. So in The Lost Family, I tell the story of a woman named Linda who was 51 when she learned through DNA testing that she had been adopted. Um, the news was dumbfounding to her and it really transformed Linda's life. 
And the realization that many people in her life knew and hadn't told her, including her mother, her late father and her brothers, was especially difficult for Linda. And then as she began to reach out to her um, genetic half siblings on both sides, their shock about her existence and what it suggested about their parents past was painful to her all over again. So the fact of having been made into a secret both in her known and in her new family made Linda feel as if she herself were somehow taboo, she said. Um, and she spoke about her sense of vulnerability when she told me, when you're 51 years old and this hits you, you feel like you're six. So I'm winding down the talk, but I just wanna pause here and make a point that I think is really important as more and more of the world is able to know its genetic origins. Um, we human beings have a tendency to ask ourselves that nature or nurture question a lot when we're trying to assess how we were formed and how our children are formed. So we like to compare nature nurture. Um, we like to say nature versus nurture, and we like to sort of rank in our minds, which is more important. Um, are you the ethnicity that you were raised? Or are you the genetic ancestry that's revealed by your DNA test? Is ethnicity and is family, are they um, a lifetime of interactions and experience or are they biology or are they both? And, and these are all questions that I've been exploring over the last four years because this topic is really, I would say the rich intersection of a number of different fields. It's philosophy, it's sociology, it's psychology, it's science and bioethics. So this question of what you really are um, is something that that um, Alice, the protagonist of the book, and her six siblings have wrestled with. Um, and I like to talk about this because Alice and her six siblings, each sibling has come out with a different answer about his or her own sense of his or her own Jewishness. Um, and each person I've interviewed must decide for themselves how to define these relationships and the revelations of self that come from this technology. Um, but what I found in interviewing seekers is that very often the correct answer to nature or nurture is yes, both. Um, and the experiences of seekers I've interviewed suggest that ranking them is a kind of fool's errand. So here's how Lori put it. Lori is a woman who discovered her um, biological dad in the databases. Um, her discovery that she was a product of a non-paternity event did not change that she still considered that the man who raised her, she considered that man to be her dad. She said, this is the guy who did the job. I can't imagine calling anybody else dad. But still Lori longed to know more about where she'd come from, to hear stories about her genetic paternal family, to see uh, where her own face had come from. Um, and many people told me that both kinds of self-knowledge are important, both the community in which you were raised and the genetic community that a DNA test places you into. Um, and both your relationship with dad, right, the man who raised you and tucked you in at night, um, and your understanding of the man who contributed half of your genetic material. So sometimes in forging a relationship with a genetic father, for instance, um, people may struggle with what to call that person. Um, but the fact that we don't always know what to call these relationships, I think I would argue represents the limits of our language rather than the limits of our capacity for self-knowledge or um, indeed the limits of the heart. So what strikes me over and over um, in stories about these, these ordinary people whose lives have intersected with revelations about their own histories is that the past, the past never really ended, right? We carry it with us inside of us. And in this moment in which we have immediate access to our own genes, um, this moment in which the past suddenly seems not so far away, the past is actively changing our present selves. Um, I'm honored that you joined me for today's talk. And um, if you're curious to know more about the topic, you can check out my book, The Lost Family. I also have a newsletter in which I send out very occasional updates on DNA and genealogy and family. Um, so if you're interested in connecting me with me there through my newsletter, you can sign up at my website, which is libbycopeland.com. And I'm excited to take your questions. So if you give me a moment, I'm going to stop my screen share and then I can do that. A second here. Thank you, Ms. Copeland. That was really interesting. And I do think it gets everyone thinking about the spring conference. I know it, it stirred a lot of thoughts for me. Um,
And so I'm going to call on the people that raised their hands. And if you came in after Jessica talked about raising your hand, um, you can either find a reaction button at the bottom to raise your hand, or when you click on the participant list, there will be an option to raise your hand. If you have problems, you can um, privately chat um, Jessica Chen or Ellen Jorgensen to help you. Um, but I just want to say that in 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 Bowen theory, you know, the past always is changing the present. <laughs> There's what what Bowen um, talked about as the family emotional process that's always alive, that's um, inherited and is always changing the present. And I, I believe part of the work um, in differentiation of self, which would be um, one of Bowen's cornerstone um, constructs um, is to um, figure out the past um, because it is changing the present and it is um, coming into our uh, emotional reactivity in today's relationships and in our family. So um, the way you said that, I, I just wrote that down because that I believe is part of uh, Bowen family systems theory. And, um, and I just think that um, no matter what someone finds out in their past in genetics or in other, in other ways through history, um, family emotional process is always important and at key and the person's level of differentiation of self, which is um, part of, of the theory. So that's what got me thinking. And um, I appreciate the different examples that you used here tonight. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, I don't know a, a ton about it, but I, but I'm, I'm, uh, I've read a little bit about it and I'm thrilled to hear that kind of commonality. I mean, it's certainly, <clears throat> something that you see over and over again, right? And in, in, um, in therapeutic situations, and obviously in the people that I've interviewed, you see it over and over. Victoria Harrison has her hand up. Ms. Copeland, thank you so much. I'm a family system psychotherapist and teacher in Houston. So I was fascinated to hear the Houston connection with the, the DNA testing. I did not know about that. Um, I know about the 23andMe and the, and, and the ancestry. Um, I was struck by how similar my family comments have been to my efforts to learn more history and their perspective on history, even though it's pretty darn ordinary relative to the families that you're reporting. But I think the difficulty that family members have in describing facts of history that are difficult, like young pregnancies or um, children that are adopted out of the family um, are, are very common. I can remember my mother saying, why do you always want to scratch the scab? <laughs> Can't you just leave it alone? When I would ask about the family's reaction to my teen pregnancy and, um, and teen marriage, it, it's, it was interesting. And, and I think about that on, uh, I wonder ab about the continuum of reaction and whether that is broader than the unintended or unknown DNA families as well. You, you would hear a lot about that on the, on the conference this weekend if you could uh, attend it. Um, and I wondered about whether you would have developed any guidelines or principles about the most effective contacts you have seen people make around the newfound information about, about their history and their re relatives. Any guidelines or principles? Did you say um, effective contact, like reaching out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, up on that. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. Um, they're not exhaustive, um, but, um, but just sort of off the top of my head. Um, so there, you often see a kind of a, um, to conflicting timelines. So 
um, I am the seeker. I take a test, right? And I discover I'm not genetically related to dad or let's just take that as an example. Um, I may then have a few months of, um, of processing um, or, or, um, or even investigation that I do, right? I, I figure out my dad's identity. Let's say he's not in the database, but it's fairly easy to discover. And let's say then I look him up on Facebook and I figure out his politics, I figure out his religion, I figure out his loves, and I decide I want to get to know him. And then I decide I want to meet him and I want to reach out. So I've had some time to kind of digest and I've had some time to kind of investigate and make this stranger feel less like a stranger, right? Make him feel um, like, like, like somebody I, I could know. Maybe I would recognize him if I ran into him in a store. Um, there's an informational asymmetry then if I'm the person who is approaching the family on the other side, because I have the knowledge and I have the um, advantage of having had processed it. And what you see on the other side is very often, um, let's say there's a family and they don't know about this child, right? Um, they are putting up their hands and they're kind of like, whoa. And there's a sense of invasion very often. Um, there's often an assumption based in no evidence that I've seen of, of actual situations where this has played out. I don't wanna say that it hasn't ever happened, but there's often an assumption that the person coming in wants something what could that thing be? Money, right? That's usually the assumption. Um, and usually the person who's coming in from what I've seen wants emotional acceptance and they want validation, right? Like I exist and I want you to acknowledge that I exist, right? And, 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 and that I should exist maybe even in some way. Um, and what can the family on the other side who feels suddenly quite invaded Right? They've got this intact sort of family that is complete and all of a sudden they've got a, a stranger coming in with this claim that feels very threatening. What can they control? Timeline. They can say, slow down. So what often happens is that the seeker coming in wants everything much more quickly than the family that is being approached. And when you cannot control anything, you will just sort of dig in your heels and slow the process. Um, and where that can be a problem is where the seeker wants almost immediate acceptance and the people on the other side are like, whoa, 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 wait, who are you again? Like, let's get to know each other. You know, how about we have a phone call in three months? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing to think about is to just kind of know going in that there will be often these conflicting timelines, right? Um, and that, um, that, that, the person, I mean, I think generally it's incumbent on the seeker to kind of slow down because yeah. you, you kind of can't control this is how they're going to respond. Um, another thing that's important to think about in terms of approaching family, and again, in the DNA testing age, it's not always something that's in our control, but, you know, to the extent that you can approach the person who is the most immediately affected by this family secret that's been hidden, the better it's going to go. So if, if you're um, if you're approaching a second cousin and the information is leaking from that second cousin to your genetic father, he will feel less in control of that information and more threatened by it. Um, and so to the extent that you can go directly to the father and make that direct appeal, often that is a better approach. But as I said, that's difficult because what happens is you take a test and who do you find in the database? You find a second cousin. It's that, that very second cousin who helps you figure out the identity of your father. Um, and maybe they're the go-between. Maybe they tell another cousin, understandably, about this discovery. So that that can make, um, that can certainly make it a bit more leaky. Um, and that those first impressions can, influence the process in a good fashion or in a, you know, in kind of a, in a, in a productive fashion or in a, in a less productive fashion. That makes a lot of sense to me. And B Bowen wrote about um, the importance of expecting the reactivity that is stirred with contact, that that is realistic. It, it's not realistic to assume a, um, a love-in though that can happen. Um, but the contact with someone, even when there's not a DNA question, 
just when there is cut off over many generations, as is the as is common in our families, that um, the the contact stirs reactivity on their part and on the seekers part. Right. And managing that is part of what lets us grow up into more realistic, responsible people and is effective over time. Uh, I think your uh, guidelines are, are wise ones. <laughs> Thank you. That's really interesting that he that he describes that. That's fascinating. Yeah, he, he was very real. He was not Pollyanna about this process. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone else in the queue. Okay, let's get. I'm inviting more people. I was also just thinking about the one to one contact that you just commented on, Libby, and the importance of that that is highlighted in, in the theory um, of working on one to one relationships. That's really interesting too. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a I have a question. This is John Swallow. I don't know if you see the little hand. I, I do. Go right ahead. Thank you. I just um, when uh, people do this research, do they ever find out, as it turns out, that the reason they don't know that they have a stepfather or or whatever is a the person interacted with their side of the family in a criminal way or b um you know has a second family i had a i used to have a personal trainer who when he was a teenager in north carolina it turns out his father had a second family and so he had a half brother and i think a half sister that he didn't know about until his teens and his his father his uh, father just acted like it was no big deal. Okay, there's a second family I've been supporting and and uh, father of. Do, do any of those things happen? And that's why the criminal uh, element, or yeah. or yeah. this uh, father you you love and mother loves too, uh, turns out to have a second family. I mean, one of the Hunt brothers of uh, of the Hunt Oil fame in the Super Bowl, uh, he had two fam he had two secret families, or two, what, two families, one of which was secret. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, have, <laughs> I have a story like that in the book. Um, yeah, and it's, um, it's, it's really challenging because what I've seen is that when a person is discovering their genetic father, they, of course, want to assume the best about that person right and they want to recognize themselves and their own goodness and moral compass in that person and to discover that that person is like deeply unethical and wronged your mom um will often put people in the position of wondering um well first of all it's incredibly painful then to own that relationship or even to know what to do with it right or do, do you reach out or do you not reach out how how high hopes can you have for a relationship with someone who did that and then also there's these questions of how much does that badness carry into me um and people that i interviewed would struggle with that um question of what have i inherited from this man um there's a woman in that i interviewed who um discovered that um, that her her mother, after a great deal of research, which was incredibly complicated, she discovered that her biological father was her, her mother's first cousin. And when she went to her mother and said, I've discovered this thing, her mother said, it was coerced. It was not a choice, right? I was raped. And mm -hmm. um, that painful revelation um i talked to the the child the adult child in question a lot about that right like how do you what do you make of that um and you know she found that quite painful um and ultimately didn't want to reach out to or know her father 
which was unusual, relatively speaking, because most of the people I interviewed, and maybe they were self-selecting, did want to reach out to and know their fathers. Um, so she had this kind of weight, um, uh, and I don't know where she is with it now because that was a few, you know, that was a few years ago. Maybe since then she's decided she does does want to reach out or definitely doesn't. I think that made it really complicated for her. Um, but interestingly, you know. <laughs> Interestingly, she told me she was still glad to know, which I found really striking. She said it explained so much about the way that she had been raised and the things that her mother had done. Um, her environment, home environment had been uh, somewhat abusive and she had a fraught relationship with her mother and it put, she felt a lot of things in context. Um, but it wasn't clear and I, and I did not interview her mom. It wasn't clear to me how that played out for her mom. Um, she told me that her mom had started therapy. And um, so it, it was an interesting thing, right? Because again, it's that, that um, the privacy of the mom versus, you know, the desire for self-knowledge. And maybe this was going to turn out to be a good thing for the mom. I don't know. Um, and then to your question, um, you know, the discovery of, a, of your father being maybe not a guy that you would want to know. Um, what does that mean in terms of your desire for relationship with him? And what does it mean for your understanding of yourself to the degree that you, uh, you know, feel like you owe some of your, of your inheritance to your father, some of your genetic inheritance? Sorry, I'll say, if, oh, go uh, ahead. Can we move on? Because I, I just, I saw another hand in there as well. <laughs> But I see Ann Curran now. Thank you. I'm, I'm, two things have come to mind in some of it in the questions and some of it in the presentation itself. And one is epigenetics, the whole field of epigenetics, which, um, as I understand it, is, is one's environment or experience altering the genetic maybe uh, strain, what, what's in fact in the physiology. Um, and you can see that in, in identical twins where they have an identical set of, gen of genes, but they, are, they have different ways of approaching aspects of life. At the same time, they also can be quite, quite in sync. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. And the other thing is how our emotional systems override a thoughtful approach to highly anxious um, situations involving relationships in particular uh, and family relationships. And it's, it's, I don't have a solution for that, but this clearly is an area that Bowen theory addresses. Um, and some, one of the other things that you said a number of times that people felt like something was different in them without knowing anything and how that affected their life course and chronic anxiety. Um, Anyway, do you have any thoughts about that? They're, they're, all of them are charged points. <laughs> Might take yeah. a year or two or three. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. You know, a lot of people describe the sense of otherness in their family of origin. Um, some people just didn't didn't feel that, or or they didn't feel that at the time, and they said, "Well, in retrospect." And I think it can be hard to tease out because um, I've also interviewed people who took a desire, they took a DNA test to desiring to find out they were not genetically related to their parents and were <laughs> they were disappointed to learn that they were, right? Mm -hmm. So that sense of otherness can arise, I think, because of, because of a, you know, a kind of a secret or, a, a, you know, you're not genetically related to your parents, but it can also arise just be <laughs> for other reasons, right? Because you feel out of sync. Um, but yes, over and over, over and over that sense of otherness, that that process of of of, oh, it now it makes sense. And the, I was really interested in this idea that you're 
your brain is suddenly throwing up all these old memories, like making them come back, which you haven't thought about in a long time that that woman Ricky described to me and others also described. Uh, oh, that thing that my mom said to me when I was six, all of a sudden, like now it makes sense as if you had hung on to them without realizing it. Um, so that was that was really interesting. Um, that anxiety to pursue the relationship and to be accepted was was uh, really, I mean, you put your finger on it, Anne, and I, I didn't think of it in terms of anxiety, but I think you're right to describe it that way. Um, and I, I saw that over and over, and I, I ha was always surprised by it um, because I, you know, I'm an outsider, obviously, so I don't have all those feelings and I would think, oh, why are they rushing forward? But that rushing forward process on the part of the seeker was a common thing. Um, and, and I, and I, and it makes sense that it's often anxiety, right. Um, or I, I don't know, a desire to kind of fix, fix it somehow, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, put, put the pieces back together in a way that makes sense or fix this, this sort of historical transgression, which was the, uh, you know, not being told that your dad was this particular man. Um, and, um, you know, there, the woman that I talk about in the book named Linda, who um, discovered that she was adopted, um, and I talked about her in the talk as well, she, um, she, you know, contacted her dad, talked to her dad a couple times. After the second phone call, he said to her, you know, even though I conceived you before, you know, I was married to my wife, like these phone calls are getting me in trouble with my wife. Like, she was not happy about this. Um, and she said to him, okay, but you've still got to tell your daughters about me. And he was like, oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. And she had this, this deep seated desire to tell them because she said, I was on the outside of a secret for so long. I know what it feels like. They're going to discover me one way or the other. You know, I'm already friends with a cousin on Facebook. One of them's in the database matching me as a sister. She hasn't seen her results yet, but she's going to, it's going to come out. So let me contact them. And she winds up direct messaging them on Facebook. And she sent me the screenshot so I could read the exchange. And it was like, hey, I'm your half sister. I'm really sorry that this is, you know, possibly going to come at you and you're not looking for this information. But like, I really want you to know because I don't want you to find out some other way. And they're like, just completely stunned by it. Um, completely stunned and completely like, who are you? Um, and it's this total mismatch of emotion, right? She's coming at them with an open heart and a whole kind of like expectation. And they are so, so freaked out that you can just hear the kind of brakes squealing. Um, and, you know, she later told me, she said, you know, something, I wish I had the direct quote off the top of my brain, but she said something like, I was so invested in like discovering and, and knowing my story that I didn't realize how my story would conflict with their story. And to me, that was like the great kind of collision of, you know, the sacred truths, if you will, right? Like the, the narratives of the self and the family, right? And, and, and her, her truth coming at them like that was so threatening to them. And that's where you see sometimes families say like, we don't believe you or who are you? What do you want? because they they're so they're so threatened by this that the only thing they can do is sort of describe a bad motivation to the person who's coming in or or just deny the results and say this these dna tests are not you know they're not reliable yeah well in bowen theory um it, chronic anxiety is so deep-seated most people live with it and don't know it it's 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 kind of come through the generations and so it's an intimate part of any individual. We all have it at some level. Um, so it's not something you see on the surface so easily necessarily. Um, but it's there. <laughs> Trust it. Um, and that's different from anxiety that's defined by many people. Uh, it's more a surface kind of reactivity. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. Do we have any other questioners? There are no other. And so I was going to um, just uh, look 
I will look for Libby Copeland on Friday or Saturday in the Zoom if you make it. I think um, I, I, I invite you and I will look for you in all of the tiles and the faces. And I, I miss having the um, in-person contact. So when people come, um, especially guest speakers that I can talk with them. So I will be looking for you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank I, you for yeah. having me. This has been such a delight. And I feel like I, you know, there's so much knowledge here that I wish I had more time to, you know, extract it from all the incredible brains here. I so I apologize that, you know, this is such a short, um, short talk, but it's it's been a thrill to be here. Well, the Bowen Center is in Georgetown. And so you can stop in when COVID is over <laughs> and and see us. So thank you. Thank you. I think um, I would like to close and thank you very, very much. Um, this has been fascinating and I do recommend the book. The book covers far more um, than, than Ms. Copeland was able to cover. Um, but so it's, it's worth the read for sure. It's a good reference as well. Uh, next month in May 13, the professional lecture series will have uh, Pat Camella, Esquire. She will be talking about the extension of Bowen theory to include natural systems of human societies and their sustaining environments. So please come join us. That will be back on a Thursday evening and we look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>